let's not say that out. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's hope. Uh, <laughs> do do, I, do any of you by chance have family in Mora? Because uh, <laughs> oops, <laughs> fa fa family or close friends in Mora. We want we want Central and Northern Minnesota to be the hardest place to go to hell from. Well, except for Mora. Except for Mora. Yeah, Mora. <laughs> not Mora. We don't care about them. <laughs> we <least> said yes. <laughs> so. Down with the Mustangs. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, go gobblers. <laughs> go gobblers. That's, that's kind of sad to say. No, if that isn't, I, I got to say, if that isn't a rallying cry, nothing is. <laughs> Come on. Go, go gobblers. <laughs> Here you. <laughs> I'm surprised, you know, I'm kind of surprised that there hasn't been some kind of a PETA uprising against Aiken for having right. a mascot that's a, that's a turkey. You I'm know? calling yeah. them when we get off. Let's call <laughs> a <PETA> complaint. <laughs> Did you uh, know? <laughs> yeah, but you guys are worried not... about the wrong things. So you know what's going on over there in that Aiken? Oh my goodness. Right. Second in the Google. <laughs> I think we're yeah. gonna have some offended people that aren't gonna come back to our Bible study. Oh man, <laughs> the numbers numbers are gonna drop. I, I honestly think that if I haven't chased them away by now, that this is probably not gonna be their issue. However, uh, give right. me a couple more weeks and I'll find something. I like to say I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> the August twenty eighth reading, and finally. The fall, finally, it's as if this is a good thing, right? Finally, the fall of Jerusalem. We've got there. <laughs> Yay. Huh? <laughs> uh, this is, there's some bad things that happen to bad people here. And it's hard to feel bad about it until you start making some comparisons to some of other leaders like Jehoiakim, right? All right, let's, uh, let's take a look. Uh, the end has finally come. Plague by famine, drought, pestilence. Which is so interesting, right? I mean, it's like they're hungry. It's not raining. There's, no, there's nothing growing. And, uh, you know, disease and pestilence through the land. And I don't think they were washing their hands for 24 seconds. Uh, which, by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it perfectly works if you... Uh, if you sing the ABC song while you're uh, washing your hands, I'm teaching my kids this so that they don't die of pestilence. Um, but these people don't know about that. They don't know about, they don't know about masks. They don't know about the hand washing and plagues, famine, drought, and pestilence have besieged the land. And uh, it's been overtaken by the Babylonian hordes from without the city of David finally falls. The historical record is merciful, uh, is mercifully brief in its account, as if the shame of it forbids a greater mention. It's like this could, this story could have been, you know, a two hour Hollywood, you know, play, but instead it's going to be a footnote, more or less. The essential details of these, the wall, the breach, the fourth month of 586 BC when Zedekiah and his troops flee the city by night, they are quickly captured. A month later, the glorious temple of Solomon, the royal palace are raised, aroused, and the remaining noblemen are killed, and the temple treasures are taken as treasure and booty and over a period of 40 years hundreds of people are taken captive and deported to babylon with the fall now undeniable reality the final chapter of the glorious era of israel comes to a close and the prophets of god are regrettably uh, vindicated ezekiel particular in particular is proved correct as to the final fate of Zedekiah and the exact manner in which it happens. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. And on the ninth day of the fourth month of Zedekiah's 11th year, the city wall was broken through. Then all the officials of King all the officials of the king of Babylon came and took seats in the middle gate. 
Nigel, uh, Nigel uh, Scherzer. Scherzer of Samgar and Nebo Shariskim. Shir, Shir, Shariskim? Sharsakim. Sharsakim, a chief officer, and Nargil Sherazar, a high official, and all the other officials of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled. They left the city at night by the way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls, and they headed towards uh, Ereva. The Babylonian army pushed them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. He was taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath and was pronounced sentenced, uh, pronounced sentenced on him. Then Riblah, the king of Babylonia, killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He also killed all the officials of Judah. Then he put out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon where he put him in prison till the day of his death. I'll give it to you, Todd. All right. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary, and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. On the tenth day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. The commander of the guard took his prisoners, Sariah the chief priest, Zephaniah the priest next in rank, and the three doorkeepers. Of those still in the city, he took the officer in charge of the fighting men and seven royal advisors. He also took the secretary who was chief officer in charge of conscripting the people of the land, 60 of whom were found in the city. Nebuzaradan, the commander, took them all and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. There at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, the king had them executed. The Babylonians broke up the bronze pillars, the movable stands, and the bronze sea that were at the temple of the Lord, and they carried all the bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, shovels, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, dishes, and all the bronze articles used in the temple service. The commander of the imperial guard, imperial guard took away the basins, censers, sprinkling bowls, pots, lampstands, dishes, and bowls used for drink offerings, all that were made of pure gold or silver. The bronze from the two pillars, the sea and the 12 bronze bowls under it, and the movable stands, which King Solomon had made for the temple of the Lord, was more than could be weighed. Each pillar was 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference. Each was four fingers thick and hollow. The bronze capital on top of one pillar was five cubits high and was decorated with a network and pomegranates of bronze all around. The other pillar with its pomegranates was similar. There were 96 pomegranates on the sides, the total number of pomegranates above the surrounding network was 100. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile some of the poorest people and those who remained in the city, along with the rest of the craftsmen, main <coughs> craftsmen and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. But Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, left behind in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing. And at that time, he gave them vineyards and fields. So Judah went into captivity away from her land. This is the number of the people Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile. In the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In Nebuchadnezzar's 18th year, 832 people from Jerusalem. In his 23rd year, 745 Jews taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar, the commander of the Imperial Guard, and there were 4,600 people in all. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors in, until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation, it rested until the 70, 70 years were complete in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. 
While the city that Jeremiah had tried to save was being destroyed and the people to whom he had preached God's word of warning were being killed or taken away captive, God reassured Jeremiah that he would be saved. Working through Nebuchadnezzar and his officers, God now fulfills his promise. Jeremiah's future is about to cross paths with a man named Gedaliah. Gid Gedaliah? Is that how you say that? Sure. Gedaliah from Nebuchadnezzar appoints, appoints a, as governor over the people left behind. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, appointed Gedaliah, son of ah ah Ahikam, uh, the son of Saf Saphon, uh, to be over the people he had left behind in Judah. While Jeremiah had been confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him, Go and tell Eben Melik the Cushite, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I am about to fulfill my words against the city, words concerning d disaster, not prosperity, at that time, they will be fulfilled before your eyes, but I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be given into the hands of those who fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape from with, <clears throat> escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had given these orders about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard. Take him and look after him. Don't harm him, but do for him whatever he asks. So Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, a chief, Nebuchadnezzar, a chief officer, Nergal Sherezer, a high official, and all the other uh, officers of the king of Babylon, sent and had Jeremiah taken out of the courtyard of the guard. They turned him over to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, to take him back to his home. So he remained among his own people. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the captives from Jerusalem. And Judah, who were being carried in exile to Babylon. I was reading Joy's comment in the chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> when the commander of the guard found Jeremiah, he said to him, The Lord your God decreed this disaster for this place. And now the Lord has brought it about. He has done just as he said he would. All this happened because you people sinned against the Lord and did not obey him. But today I am free you from the chains on your wrists. Come with me to Babylon, if you like, and I will look after you. But if you do not want to, then don't come. Look, the whole country lies before you. Go wherever you please. However, before Jeremiah turned to go, Nebuzaradan added, go back to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has appointed over the towns of Judah, and live with him among the people, or go anywhere else you please. Then the commander gave him provisions and a present and let him go. So Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, at Mizpah and stayed with him among the people who were left behind in the land. I like how he said, go to this specific place or go wherever you please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Go wherever you want. <laughs> And then, he, and then the commander gave him provisions and a present. A present. <laughs> what was the present, I wonder? <laughs> what was that about? Was it gold or? Yeah. A little, a little parting Not gift. Yeah. A Happy present. birthday. Here a you go. A sandwich on the way out the door. I mean, what yeah. were we talking what about? What was the present? Yeah, we'll have to look that up. <laughs> oh, golly. Well, what do you guys think? Anything that you want to point out before we uh, take a gander at some of the questions? Uh, I was just, I just thought it was interesting. The last part, what, jo what, what Josh was uh, reading that Jeremiah, that he was left in the garden and the, the Babylonians released him. And then all of a sudden they get, you know, they, they made him feel comfortable and gave him food and provisions. And, oh, stay here, you know, and it's just uh, the reward that he was getting uh, to stay with his people, stay in the land still. And from the enemy, he was getting, you know, provisions and, 
and everything like that. So uh, I just, uh, it's just neat to see how God is still taking care of Jeremiah in the midst of all this turmoil. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Good point. Any other things that jumped out of the text, Ilka? Uh, I'm going to look up what a wick trimmer is. <laughs> It's, it trims wicks. It trims the wicks of the oh, candles. It's to trim your wicks. Okay. Yeah. Oh. You know, <laughs> very clever the way they title some of these things. Uh, <laughs> I bet a weed eater like for wicks. Uh -huh. I was thinking that Zedekiah, uh, he had a long time to think about what he didn't do. That would have been torture. Uh huh. And in, in the dungeon, yeah. it's like, why didn't I listen to Jeremiah? And um, yeah, there comes uh, a moment, I think, in a man's life when you when you've been given godly advice that you ignore or a woman's life. I mean, when mm -hmm. you hear godly advice and you ignore it and you think that you know better and then things work out badly for you, that you kind of mark those moments in certain ways. And uh, and this would have been like the accentuated worst case scenario of that story. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so. How does the book of Jeremiah make it clear that even the last of the kings of Judah and his subjects suffered for their own sins, for their own sins? Not because right now, I mean, it, it all begins on the on the historical record of the the pattern of sins, and it would be easy to look back and 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 get mad about what has happened in the past, much like a lot of people do when they come into our offices and they they complain about their parents or the the history with which they didn't wind up where they thought they ought to be in life. And mm -hmm. it becomes a moment where, you know, everyone needs to take stock of their own life and say, wait, wait a second. Uh, you know, I, I brought my own life upon my own self. You know, it isn't, it isn't a matter of, of what my parents did. I, it's not a matter of what my, I can't keep blaming. Uh, how does the book of Jeremiah make it clear that the, that the last of the kings of Judah and his subjects suffered for their own sin. Do you guys see that anywhere? Well, I just was thinking while you were saying, talking about kind of consequences, and it feels like as we've read through Jeremiah, a lot of the answers to the questions have resulted in us talking about consequences for our sins and, and uh, discipline. And so I think it just points out that consequences are real and yeah. and you can learn from them one of the uh, things i love about what you just said josh is the power of having talked this book through or these series of books through and going wait a second there is a pattern here and i'm sick and tired of the pattern you know i'm even sick and tired of talking about the pattern uh mm. much less the weight of the pattern you know and i think that's the point i mean and in some degree it's like if you would just read this it should make you feel uh -huh. tired and sick of sin and help you make choices that are different than that. You know? mm -hmm. Well, and the fact, and the fact that they all, you know, they all came true. You know, it, you know, nothing, nothing was left undone. Everything that was, that was prophesied, everything that was foretold, all of the warnings, you know, right down to the very end. And all the way back to the promises of God back in Deuteronomy. I mean, mm -hmm. where, you know, if you do these things, you won't get to keep this land. Yeah, I mean, this won't, you don't get to live here forever, right. thumbing your nose at the God who gave it to you. You just don't get to do that. And, uh, and so walk humbly before your God. And they went, yeah, not so much, you know. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. needed to read Deuteronomy 30 again. Right? I mean, you isn't that this? <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, it's just, it's just so interesting. You know, the two, the two chief priests, uh, Sarah, uh, Sariah and Zephaniah, they, you know, they're the ones working in the temple all the time. They're the ones trying to keep the people in line, telling them, oh, it's all great. Nothing's going to happen. And what right. happened to them? They were, they were executed. They were, they were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, for their disobedience to God. Uh, and so it's a, uh, uh, it, it makes it very clear, <laughs> I think this book does, that, uh, you know, you will suffer for your sins. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the wages of sin is death. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Linfield. I hadn't thought of that before, but imagine those guys, you know, being in charge of the, the spiritual growth and development of the people, and they're, they're in constant opposition to Jeremiah. Right. And, and, and he keeps saying this, and they keep saying, no, 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 it's really like this. Ignore him. Listen to us. And in everything that he says, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, how, you got to wonder what, what, what's going through their minds. Right. 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 There was no excuses, Steve says in the chat, and yet the spiritual leadership of the day continues to lead the people towards ignoring the, the in, impending doom and the consequences of, of their choices. I want to say, hey, you guys got to understand, this is going to cause you irreputable harm. Right. They're not saying that. Uh, they're, not, they're not allowing their voices to enter the... the the, the prophetic choir. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We just coincidentally were chatting as we began the reading today and talking about uh, can't wait for the New Testament. <laughs> Somebody's like, oh, I'm going to miss the Old Testament. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> can't wait for all said, said no one ever <laughs> in in consequence you know there's something changes so it's true though i mean it and like you said mark you know the fact that we've walked through it kind of painfully sometimes just walking through these books which you wouldn't normally do and you probably wouldn't normally spread it out every morning i know i'm i mean i'm sure a lot of people have but the fact that we've created something where we're forced to spend each morning going through them. I keep thinking, I'm actually excited, looking forward to the New Testament, because I'm like, man, it's gonna, you're gonna have that perspective where, you know, we waited months and we can compare that in our, you know, first world culture to waiting hundreds of years <laughs> for something to happen, for the Messiah. I'll also be interested to see if they, if they, I haven't looked, I, I, I haven't glanced ahead to see if they present the Gospels in a synoptic uh, way where you get it kind of merged, or if it's, um, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I love that idea of spending time in, in those uh, Gospel books because I love Matthew, Mark, Luck, and John. Well, luck. <laughs> Well, is that how you say it? Is, is, is it different than that, Joy? Lucky. It's, it's lucky. <laughs> um, no, I, I am hoping that it's split up because that's really interesting to, if there's a chronological order that mixes there, the Gospels up a little bit. There is. There uh, is. For sure. Yeah, that's exciting. I've never, you know, I've, I've never seen that. So. so I'm guessing that's how it's presented more as a synoptic, synoptic yep. gospel with, with Matthew mark and luke and john would be separate because it's really written completely different and they don't use a, a path and pattern that's similar right. mm-hmm. also i'd be interested to see if in the chat they mentioned the q document that that they all probably used as a uh, as a place of following along as they're developing theirs there's the lost document that was for sure used by matthew mark and luke as they were writing their outlines but well, I like some the, of that in some months. Let's stay with our questions yeah. today. We yeah. got we yeah. got fish to fry. What made Zedekiah's punishment much worse than that of the first king of Judah, Jehoiakim, who had surrendered to Babylon? Why was Zedekiah's punishment? What made it worse? Yeah, you know, Mark, I can't, I, I can't imagine. Um, I think of my own sons. And, and if my actions resulted in me being taken into captivity and to have my two, stunt, two sons stood before me and, and killed in front of my eyes, and then to have that be the last thing that I ever see, mm-hmm. I, I, I just, in, I cannot begin to conceptualize what that would be like, mm-hmm. you know, the torture that would be there, knowing that it was because of me, that that, you no, know, there was no other reason there's no other contributing factor. It was because of what I did. And that's what happened. So let's kind of link questions two and three then. And how did Jehoiakim, Jehoi- who, which we didn't read about specifically, right? Living in Babylon, receive his reward for obeying God's unusual directive to surrender the army. 
What would uh, contrast those two in your in your in your answer? Well, it sounds like you know. In in his case, I don't I don't know that it specifies you know how long he lived, but he certainly wasn't put to death. Yeah, which was interesting because we were talking before the chat um, about Jehoiakim and just how wicked this man really was, and how in spite of that, in spite of his wickedness, because he did obey God in that in that one instance, his life was spared. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of mind-boggling because, you know, you had, you had done a little search on him, Mark, and discovered some of his huge iniquities. Yeah. Right? Well, he was a massive fornicator. He totally uh, had incredible ancestral relations with his daughter-in-law, with his mother, with his stepmother, with uh, all kinds of family. And then oftentimes would put him to death because of his feelings of shame. And then uh, just incredible adulterous relationships all over the palace and and would put people to death and then if he saw land he from his friends and neighbors he just put them to death and would take it he was no beloved king and as we also learned from some of the rabbinic readings that we studied uh, we took a glance at uh, some of some references from rabbinic readings not only all of that he also had tattoos linfield no unbelievable so there I'm, you go i'm a sinner <laughs> there you go so there's that you know we got to take that into consideration if that wasn't bad enough you know. <laughs> yeah the tattoo jeez tattoos wait josh has a tattoo yeah oh, glenn i don't remember if it was his mother or not you have to look i mean it was like maybe it was, I think maybe his stepmom I no i'm just kidding no, I'm, a, I'm a christian uh, oh josh does <laughs> it he's a christian yeah, he does. <laughs> but here's something interesting about Jehoiakim. Uh, well, that I just thought of. I don't know if it's true or anything. I just was, you know, Jehoiakim went to into exile, and he became, you know, just like the regular people in exile. Uh, I'm sure that you know maybe he was uh, given a little bit more, but um, you know, his. I would think that the people around him would be like oh you know kind of giving him giving him a couple piece or a piece of their mind once in a while like you did this to us and and in captivity um and and that that would be probably a pretty bad um punishment for Jehokin, uh constantly just getting bombarded with look at what you did <laughs> you know um and then zedekiah being put in a dungeon or, or a, a prison for the rest of his life in in darkness uh and with his own thoughts um that uh man that uh that is torture right there mm -hmm. yeah you want a glimpse of what hell could be like that <laughs> and you know. with your own thoughts of why why didn't i do this why didn't i listen when i had a chance hmm. um and so uh, yeah, pretty pretty interesting contrast that in my in my little mind. About yeah, what you, in, in, in it, you know, setting those guys aside, then looking at Jeremiah, what what can we learn about uh, from his character and motives from the fact that he chose to stay with his people rather than leave, um, and and then he receives honor from Babylon, which probably has less to do about him and more to do about God, like you mentioned, Linfield. But what what do you think we can learn about his character? He was devoted. I mean, you know, when it's, it, it kind of says it right there, you know, his people, these are my people. The, I, why, why would I, why would I depart from them? They're, they're a part of me. I'm a part of them. This is my family, so to speak. But, you know, he's, he's dedicated to him. He was, I, I, you know, I think it also shows a level of sincerity that all along as he's, as he's prophesying these things, he really did have the people in mind, you know, even as he as he's following God's commands, mm -hmm. his heart was for these people all the way through. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, I agree. I was just uh, reading my dad's comment. Jeremiah had special insight to God's heart, and I think it's just a reminder for us that God's heart is for the people. 
and not just a certain people or, or a certain kind of prosperous people, but, mm-hmm. you know, it kept popping up. We were talking about how the poor people kept their homeland. And it just reminds you of God's heart for, you know, in the Beatitudes, the poor in spirit, the meek, the people that God really cares about and is, is after. And mm-hmm. Jeremiah kind of was a physical example of that. Yeah. And, uh, one of the many prophets that portrayed God's heart well. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting, you know, so some of these poor people that wind up kind of having some little bit of land and some vineyards, they, they're t- tending to that, caring for themselves, making their own way in the midst of all this, this horrible hardship. But the, the whole of, is- of Israel, I mean, the land itself, it, I don't know if you noticed in the text, but it was given a Sabbath rest for 70 years. <laughs> it's just, you know, and I just love that language that uh, it, it experienced a real rest. And uh, it was just, I just, just had not thought of that. I mean, it was like, who, who wound up winning in the middle of this? Well, the land did, you know. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of an interesting frame that uh, the, the writer put on it you know what that makes me think uh, just kind of a quick little story but it made me this last question that we answered made me think of i'm really fascinated with this guy brian head welch his nickname is head and he's a guitar player of the band corn mm-hmm. which is a obviously a scary gnarly crazy band from the 90s i actually really like corn's music but um he became a, I mean, he was just living a crazy life. He's got an amazing testimony. He became a Christian in 2005. He quit the band, came back to the band in 2015. And it's just this super controversial thing with the, the Christian world. They're like, how could you go back to that band? Because some of the members are Christians, some of them very much aren't. And I was watching him in an interview. And um, again, it's controversial. You might not agree, but he... He just said something like somebody was like, how, you know, how could you do that? And he's like, those are my people. He's like, those are the people God called me to. That's who I am here to reach. And he literally, uh, there, you can find videos of him after all their shows. I mean, it's a crazy culture. There's a lot of darkness and stuff in it, but he's leading people to Christ outside of their shows night after night on tour. And, uh, yeah. Um, Sherry said Adam and Danielle got to meet him. I actually went and saw Corn with Adam. And uh, it was so weird and scary at one point. I had to leave. I had to walk out because it was so dark. And then I actually looked up videos later of Brian Head Welch outside of that exact show leading some guys to Christ. Hmm. And uh, I, I don't even know what to think about that really, but it was just so like, I don't know. It just makes you think like, you know, how uh, God calls us just like these prophets, maybe to, to speak for the people and to reach the people that maybe other people don't want to reach. I don't know. I don't even know if that's relevant, but it's a good story. <laughs> well, one of the things that does speak to is like Jeremiah, the, the heart that he had to, to serve and be with the people and that God would might give us as a church real heart for the community where he's planted us and a a similar kind of passion to to go at uh at all costs to serve and to love and to be light in dark places and that god would give us a sense of how to do that through his spirit and uh linfield why don't you pray that we really do develop a passion for those who do not know and are completely lost in their own sin and ask God to give us eyes to see how we can serve him best in the midst of this crazy life that we live. Let's pray. Lord, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we come before you and we, we thank you over and over for being God, Lord, and Savior. And uh, thank you for being a personal God that loves us uh, personally and knows us well. And Lord, and thank you for the opportunities we get to to share your good news, the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray that uh, that you will give us 
uh, give us your heart. I pray that you will help us to reach those that are far from you. And Lord, I pray that uh, you will use us in a mighty way, that we'll be eyes and feet of you, Lord, that we will uh, have the eyes to see and the, the ears to hear and the heart to love, um, just like you do, Lord, so that people can come to know the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Lord, you bring life, and I just pray that uh, in the midst of, of the craziness that this world is, is giving us right now, that we, Lord, here in the Brainerd Lakes area, here in central Minnesota, can be light, um, uh, and that people can come to know you, and that we can be that city on the hill, Lord, where people see a beacon of hope, and it's you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for dying on that cross so that we could have life. And Lord, thank you for coming out of that tomb so that we can have life eternally with you. And that uh, sin has been conquered and we have been saved and set free. No longer a slave to sin, but we are yours through and through. Help us to reach those that are lost. In your name, amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks, gang, for studying with us and thinking deeply about the word with us. Uh, it's a rainy day out there today, or was when I last looked. And enjoy what uh, God has in front of you. Yeah. Thanks. Toodaloo. Bye, everybody. Hey, guys.